This program is a video presentation via Zoom of the Civil War Roundtable of the District of Columbia. Founded in 1951, the Roundtable hosts monthly presentations at a location near Washington, D.C., more recently at the Fort Myer Officers Club. For more information, go to www.cwrtdc.org. We have a very interesting and very full program ahead of us. I have the privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, Frank J. Scaturo. Mr. Scaturo belongs to that rare group of persons with experiences in almost all of the areas of interest to the members of our roundtable. He is an historian, an attorney, a professor, a politician, a public advocate, and a writer. Mr. Scaturo received his undergraduate degree in history and political science from Columbia University in New York City, where he won Columbia's Albert Marion Ellsberg Prize for achievement in modern history. He is also a graduate of Pennsylvania Carey Law School, winning the Fred G. LeBron Memorial Prize for the top paper in constitutional law. Mr. Scaturo practiced law as an associate at Cadwallader, Wickersham and Taft, and as a partner at Fisher Broyles. He served as counsel to the Constitution for the Senate Judiciary Committee from 2005 to 2009, where he advised Republican senators on constitutional law issues and nominations, including John Roberts and Samuel Alitos. He has taught courses as a visiting professor at Hofstra Law School on constitutional law and the legislative process. He is also a past Republican candidate for Congress in New York's fourth congressional district. And as impressive as is that background, what brings us together tonight is his work that began when he was a college student. At Columbia, he spearheaded the restoration of Grant's tomb in New York City's Riverside Park. And I have to admit during my own time at Columbia, I visited the tomb only once and I was unimpressed and a bit sad about its condition but that was because my visit was well before Mr. Scaturo began his effort to restore the monument, and I am glad he did. He founded the Grant Monument Association, and he fought successfully for a $1.8 million restoration of the tomb, which was completed in 1997. Consistent with his interests, Mr. Scaturo has published a number of books and articles in the area of history and law, including the Supreme Court Retreat from Reconstruction, an exploration, which is an exploration of a key chapter in the history of civil rights, Public Companies, a book he co-authored on how to be a responsible public company in the wake of the corporate scandals of a decade ago, and the book he co-edited with Chris Mikowski, Grant at 200, Reconsidering the Life and Legacy of Ulysses S. Grant, which will be released during Grant's 200th birthday observances this year. Again, I am delighted and honored tonight to welcome Mr. Frank Scaturo. Take it away, Mr. Scaturo. Well, thank you so much, Kurt, for the kind introduction. And thank you all for uh, joining us uh, tonight. Really appreciate your being here uh, together virtually during this grant bicentennial year. So I thought I'd talk tonight about uh, Grant's presidency and someone who, as many of you know, uh, would have his reputation battered by historians during the 20th century. I mean, the collective historical memory of Grant that emerged during the last century would accord him the country's gratitude for you know, his heroic leadership during the Civil War and for the memoirs he penned about that service, but nothing else. In polls of historians to rate the presidents, which were pioneered in 1948 by Arthur Schlesinger Sr., Grant was ranked second only to rock bottom Warren G. Harding, with those two presidents the only ones rated as flat failures. Now, that remained the case in a 1982 survey by Robert Murray and Tim Blessing of some 846 PhD holding members of college history departments. They placed Grant, uh, again, second to Harding at the bottom. Uh, 
Well, fast forward to the 21st century and Grant's reputation has taken an unmistakable upswing. In the C-SPAN polling that began in 2000, he was ranked at first a substandard 32 out of 39, but in their most recent poll last year, he went up to number 20, the most dramatic rise of any president, both in C-SPAN's shorter history of polling and also in the broader history of such surveys. Now, over the last quarter century, there's been a succession of studies on Grant that came out. These recent authors uh, who had written about Grant depicted Grant's presidency in a distinctly more favorable light than some of the scathingly negative uh, consensus that had emerged during the 20th century. So the recent reassessments shared to one degree or another an emphasis on Grant's handling of reconstruction, particularly his commitment to equal rights for their sympathetic depictions of his presidency. Yet while his stock has been rising, scholars still generally don't describe Grant as great or even near great as president. So tonight I'd like to discuss President Grant's record and also some of the historiography, the odyssey taken by historians who've written about his presidency. Without this, it is hard to appreciate why history has resisted giving Grant a place among our best remembered presidents. But let's start with the constitution since every presidency starts with an oath to defend it. While the constitution does not assign presidents a direct role in the ratification of constitutional amendments, presidents can still use the power they do have to secure them. The most foundational constitutional developments in which presidents played a significant role were those of the founding and the Civil War Reconstruction era. Three presidents in particular played such a role, Washington, Lincoln, and Grant. Now you can say another transformation in constitutional understandings certainly occurred during Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal, uh, but that's a separate discussion as it did not arise from the adoption or amendment uh, of the Constitution. Now, as the country's first president, George Washington provided form to the office that the Constitution created, and the Civil War Reconstruction era saw the ratification of three new sweeping amendments to the Constitution. The 13th Amendment, which Lincoln helped move through Congress before its ratification by the states almost eight months after his assassination, prohibited slavery and involuntary servitude. The 14th Amendment, among other things, established both national and state citizenship for people born or naturalized in the United States and guaranteed the equal protection of the laws. That was ratified in 1868 without any help from Lincoln's successor, Andrew Johnson. Johnson opposed measure after measure to protect former slaves that were advanced by radical Republicans in Congress. Now a 15th amendment providing a constitutional guarantee against racial discrimination in voting was proposed by the House and Senate within a week before Grant's inauguration on March 4th, 1869. But ratification by the states would take nearly another year and was far from a foregone conclusion. Grant put the full weight of his authority behind the 15th amendment. He urged ratification in his first inaugural address, signed legislation requiring ratification by states still under military rule. He made appeals individually to the states and he arm twisted where necessary. Now by ensuring for former slaves the full political equality inherent in the right to vote, the 15th amendment was in some respects the apex of the most profound changes to the constitution since the founding period. And its successful ratification was recognized by contemporaries as owing to President Grant. But during Reconstruction, around 2,000 African Americans were elected or appointed to public office, with the first members of both the US Senate uh, and House of Representatives taking their seats in 1870. Now, Grant's achievements in the realm of equal rights hardly ended there. In the face of protracted resistance to the advancement of former slaves, uh, most notably by the Ku Klux Klan, Grant followed through with an array of significant legislation. He signed into law the statute establishing the, the Department of Justice. He also secured enforcement legislation. Five enforcement acts passed between 1870 and 1872 
that provided the basis for his repeated intervention in the South in order to protect 14th and 15th Amendment rights. Pursuant to those acts, uh, most uh, notably including the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, Grant employed federal troops to protect former slaves, most dramatically by suspending habeas corpus in nine South Carolina counties in 1871. The prosecution that followed through 1872 crushed the 19th century Klan. A few years later, Grant signed the nation's first desegregation law of national scope, the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Beyond the most prominent example of South Carolina, Grant deployed federal troops to Southern states to enforce reconstruction in a number of troubled jurisdictions throughout his presidency. Now, white Southerners were opposed to black political power in great enough numbers that a racial party line defined much of the divide between the Democratic and Republican parties in the South. That fueled much of the drive by Southern whites to redeem, as the term went, black supported Republican governments with Democratic governments. This tended to occur with the most abusive behavior by whites where African-American citizens were most numerous. Even after the Klan's demise, white Southern resistance would continue in forms that combined Klan tactics with social ostracism and economic pressure as more subtle methods of intimidation. Black voter turnout for Republicans increased in some Southern states, but during the mid 1870s, more white voters who had abstained from voting came to the polls than, than blacks who had not previously voted and that expedited a number of state takeovers by the Democratic Party. From both adversaries and the press, Grant's interventions evoked recurring condemnations uh, throughout his uh, presidency that accused him of monarchical and militaristic repression, often captured in the charge of Caesarism. And hopefully you see that this is one of the uh, uh, cartoons brutally depicting his uh, intervention in, uh, in Louisiana. So during his second term, Grant had to grapple with the intensifying opposition to Southern uh, intervention among white Northerners, uh, among whom racial prejudice fed a double standard that disparaged Southern blacks as backward where they did not assert their rights and obnoxious where they did. While he was cognizant that overuse of troops where they were not necessary could cause the collapse of the Republican coalition he depended on for success, he stood ahead of an increasing number of fellow Republicans who were ready to abandon enforcement. Now Grant as president repeatedly made public statements embracing equality, including when he advocated in his 1875 speech, quote, equal right and privileges to all men, irrespective of nationality, color, or religion. No president before him ever endorsed a full accommodation of such a wide range of people into the scheme of American democracy. On numerous occasions throughout his presidency, Grant defended the principles of Reconstruction. He did so perhaps most intensely when it was most unpopular. In fact, in early 1875, Grant delivered one of the most impassioned messages ever made by a president on any subject, detailing racial violence in Louisiana and justifying his widely denounced military intervention on behalf of African Americans and white Republicans against whom, quote, the spirit of hatred and violence is stronger than law. During the 1876 election, the last to occur during his tenure, Grant used both troops and federal marshals to protect the polls in the jurisdictions where they were most vulnerable, including over 11,000 deputy marshals and almost 5,000 election supervisors. Grant's successor, Rutherford Hayes, withdrew the last remaining troops from their posts early in his presidency in a move that would re be remembered as a repudiation of Grant's policy and as the end of Reconstruction. What is telling is how Reconstruction came to be remembered by history, particularly the relationship between uh, its uh, falling and rising reputation and that of Grant. So the Dunning School, which was an academic offshoot of the broader myth of the lost cause that came to define the Civil War Reconstruction era for much of the 20th century, 
rose as the era of Jim Crow segregation and disfranchisement emerged in the South. Columbia University professor William Dunning articulated the premise of the historical school that bears his name in racially invidious language. He said that after slavery's, quote, disappearance, its place must be taken by some set of conditions which, if more humane and beneficent in accidents, must in essence express the same fact of racial inequality. The progress in the acceptance of this idea in the North has measured the progress in the South of the undoing of Reconstruction. Dunning's colleagues expressed similar views on race. Now this school of historical thought condemned Grant for clinging to Reconstruction. It compared him negatively to those he outlasted in his commitment to it. Dunning ended his 1907 narrative on Reconstruction by writing, quote, Grant in 1868 had cried peace but in his time with the radicals and carpet baggers in the saddle, there was no peace. With Hayes, peace came. This is a contemporary uh, cartoon that illustrates a long running point. Uh, one of Dunning's students, Edwin Woolley, derided Grant for insisting, quote, the 14th and 15th amendments applied to the whole union and must be enforced equally throughout the union. Regardless of consequences, established law must be obeyed. Grant could see no other way. Until Chuck Calhoun's book came out five years ago, only two comprehensive narrative accounts dedicated exclusively to the Grant presidency had been published. Those were by William Heseltine and Alan Nevins, and they were published back to back in 1935 and 1936 respectively, a period when the Dunning interpretation was still prevalent. The Dunning School pervaded the perception of Reconstruction all the way to the US Supreme Court and even persisted at the dawn of the Civil Rights Movement. In his unpublished concurring opinion in the landmark desegregation case Brown versus Board of Education, Justice Robert Jackson called Reconstruction, quote, a confused and deplorable era that gave rise to offensive Reconstruction measures that contributed to the race problem in the South. Eight years later, Justice Felix Frankfurter, who like Jackson joined the court's unanimous decision in Brown, echoed a law review article in a dissent in a case involving a statute derived from the Ku Klux Klan Act. He wrote, quote, it is very queer to try to protect human rights in the middle of the 20th century by a leftover from the days of General Grant. Notice the visceral contempt that had been baked into the memory of reconstruction in general, and Grant's presidency in particular from some of the nation's most distinguished legal minds, even as they advanced civil rights in their own time. In 1935, W.E.B. Du Bois had noted, not a single great leader of the nation during the Civil War and Reconstruction has escaped attack and libel. Indeed, while Lincoln attained a certain historical apotheosis, no leader of Reconstruction was held up as a political model in contrast to any number of leaders of the founding era. Uh, consider from the founding era, the stellar reputations of not only the most prominent tier of founders like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, but even what we might call second tier names like John Jay and George Mason. They have all been better remembered than any government leader during reconstruction. President Grant was the most prominent of many reconstruction era leaders who to put it bluntly, were thrown on the ash heap of American political history. And strangely enough, for many years after the civil rights movement discredited the racialist Dunning School that did so much damage to Grant's presidential reputation, the contempt that attached to him persisted. It was as if the visceral reaction to him needed another rationale. Now, while a number of works, including Eric Foner's acclaimed 1983 History of Reconstruction, took notice of Grant's battle against the Klan, William McFeely's Pulitzer Prize winning 1981 biography of Grant jumped to conclusions about the 18th president's indifference to racial issues that drew really more from cynicism than from evidence. Earlier historians had already recognized Reconstruction to be Grant's highest priority when it was unpopular and no, that basic fact did not change once Reconstruction earned historians respect. 
Yet such inconsistency could be found in the work of a single historian as illustrious as C. Van Woodward, who many consider the greatest historian of the 20th century. Author of the classic, The Strange Career of Jim Crow, he was no friend of segregation, but the native Southerner had a penchant for attacking what he perceived as Yankee arrogance. In 1957, he depicted Grant as the tool of radical Republicans whom he called extremists. And he charged that Grant fell under the influence of the extremists and went over completely to their Southern policy, disillusioning moderates. But then in 1981, Woodward pulled an about face, attacking Grant for his supposed quote, hostility toward the more radical war aim for black franchise and racial equality and blaming him for the abandonment of reconstruction. Now, a similar inconsistency occurred in the opposite direction in how commentators answered one of American history's favorite what if questions. What would Lincoln have done if he had not been assassinated? Those who condemned reconstruction emphasized the leniency of Lincoln's wartime reconstruction plans and his conciliatory spirit, which translated into sparing the South the supposed horrors of radical reconstruction by which suffrage and equal rights were imposed. That became the dominant counterfactual narrative when the Dunning School was prevalent. But after reconstruction revision, revisionism, which basically held reconstruction to be a good thing, uh, became dominant, it became more common to emphasize Lincoln's last public address in which he expressed his preference for limited African-American suffrage and to suggest his openness to full racial equality. Of course, counterfactual history is not true history and the Lincoln what if question is unanswerable. More telling is the inconsistency visible in historians treatment of Lincoln and Grant as Rorschach tests onto which admiration is projected in one case and contempt in the other, regardless of how much historical premises change. Regardless of what he might have done had he lived, Lincoln deserves credit for the 13th Amendment, which provided the predicate for the protection of equal rights and the conferral of the ballot that followed. But it is incongruous to simultaneously deny credit to the president who actually did advance those further transformative changes to American democracy. It took a glaring level of inconsistency in presidential history for America's collective historical memory to recognize the pedigree of equal rights as Lincoln's vision while refusing in Justice Frankfurter's spirit to recognize it as Grant's vision. That Grant distinguished himself among presidents in the realm of equal rights should be obvious from the records of his successors. This is not to say that the transition to the Hayes administration marked a conscious rejection of the Reconstruction Amendments. Uh, Grant's four Republican successors who served during the 16 year period between Hayes and Benjamin Harrison repeatedly expressed the importance of the recent amendments and made efforts to encourage biracial democracy in the South. They pursued a variety of different, sometimes indirect strategies toward that end. The 16 year period between Hayes and Harrison also saw more than 1200 voting rights prosecutions in the former Confederacy, all under statutes signed into law by Grant. Still, for all their overlooked efforts to address the Southern question, Grant's immediate successors appear anemic next to Grant. Yet even that immediate period after Grant was far from the low point for African-Americans. It took a disfranchisement movement during the 1890s to attain that as Southern states advanced measures to disfranchise African-Americans, including literacy tests, poll taxes, and grandfather clauses. Those factors led to the free fall in African-American turnout that marked the disfranchisement that culminated in the early 20th century. Of course, the story of the Reconstruction Amendments does not end there. Those same provisions of the Constitution provided the basis for federal action during the civil rights movement of the 20th century. A surviving section of the Ku Klux Klan Act for which Grant had personally lobbied with a visit to the Capitol was taken out of its dormancy and invoked by Dwight Eisenhower when he federalized the National Guard to enforce a desegregation order in Little Rock. 
the same authority was invoked to, to utilize the National Guard and the Army by John Kennedy to enforce court ordered desegregation in Mississippi and by Lyndon Johnson to protect civil rights marchers from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. Another surviving provision of the Ku Klux Klan Act now codified as section 1983, which among other things protects those who are deprived of constitutional rights under color of state law is widely litigated and arguably the most important civil rights law apart from the constitution itself. For years, those more recent presidents received more recognition for achievements in civil rights than Grant did. When C-SPAN conducted its historian surveys, the category in which Grant consistently fared best was pursued equal justice for all. In that category, he was ranked at number 18 in 2000, number nine in 2009, number 10 in 2017, and number six in 2021. Those attuned to recent Grant scholarship often place Grant after Lincoln and Lyndon Johnson for his efforts in the realm of equal rights. If only three chief executives could occupy a pantheon of great civil rights presidents, it would be those three. Numerical ranking from there, even as a matter of a single category of achievement, might not make much sense. The argument for putting Lincoln on top would rest on emancipation. A convincing argument can be made that the emancipation of slaves was the greatest single step toward equality for any group of Americans, and that it was a prerequisite for the progress on race that followed. But does that surpass the cumulative total of measures in the other two administrations that actually amounted to civil and political equality? Now, Johnson's civil rights achievements can be said to extend beyond race to other categories of discrimination, including sex and age, uh, that were not substantially covered during the 19th century. But racial caste was so distinctive as to pose a uniquely grave impediment to America's ability to achieve its ideals of liberty and equality. In that area, Johnson could point primarily to three legislative achievements, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. But the constitutional foundations for these achievements were already in place thanks in part to his predecessor 90 years earlier. And other groundwork had been laid by the Supreme Court's repudiation of segregation, plus new civil rights acts in 1957 and 1960 during the decade before Johnson's ascendance, uh, ascension to the presidency. Grant secured the addition to the Constitution of Voting Rights, which was really the true culmination of political equality regardless of race, and he added to that five enforcement acts covering all the reconstruction amendments, a department of justice, and even an anti-segregation law. The 1964 and 1965 acts addressed Jim Crow measures that arose after Grant's time, and the 64 act carried the desegregation principle farther than the 1875 Civil Rights Act, which the Supreme Court had struck down in 1883, but Grant started with less of a foundation in place for equal rights when he was inaugurated and had to traverse more territory, executive as well as legislative, than Johnson did. As violent as white Southern resistance to civil rights was during the 1960s, it was an order of magnitude greater during Reconstruction with Grant repeatedly intervening in a South plagued by a scale of recalcitrance far beyond that which faced Johnson. As nominations went, Johnson appointed the nation's first African-American cabinet member and Supreme Court justice among numerous lower profile appointments. Grant in his time appointed far more African-Americans than any previous president, including the first to serve as diplomats and a staggering number of others who were customs collectors, postmasters, internal revenue agents, and clerks. In short, on the issue of racial equality, it is difficult to rank any president's efforts above Grant's. From his starting point, his measures were more sweeping and the barrage of obstacles he confronted greater than those of any one president during the civil rights movement. As 20th century civil rights leaders have assumed something like the status of founding fathers for a modern age, it is incongruous to denigrate those who established a strikingly similar paradigm of equality during America's second founding. Historians who have run circles in search of an explanation faulting Reconstruction's leaders for the lack of a sustained 
biracial democracy in the South appear less credible as the broad trajectory of American history affirms just how intractable the race issue would be. To fail to recognize America's most accomplished leaders because of their later repudiation, a repudiation that would not last, appears even more senseless as Jim Crow recedes into the past and the 14th and 15th Amendments are an operative reality for a growing preponderance of US history. To value America as a multiracial democracy should be to reject any conception of presidential greatness that is too narrow to include Grant's example. Now, while the Dunning School has been rejected, uh, history has not entirely shaken the old habit of viewing Grant's presidency through a hostile lens. Uh, consider that this presidency was rich in both domestic and foreign policy uh, achievements, uh, even apart from reconstruction. And I'll pull up another uh, cartoon here. This is a Thomas Nast special for that President Grant and why they don't like him that came out during his reelection uh, campaign of 1872. In his first inaugural address, Grant had committed himself to stabilizing fiscal and monetary policy, a strong foreign policy, reform of Indian policy, and the ratification of the 15th Amendment. He would follow through on all fronts during his presidency. The 15th Amendment has already been noted. On the economic policy front, he successfully took on the most serious fiscal problems the government had ever faced and in the process substantially raised the nation's credit. The Civil War had fueled an unprecedented national debt of more than $2 billion when Grant was inaugurated and had given rise to new kinds of currency unbacked by specie, by which I mean gold or sil silver, uh, which left contentious questions of monetary policy to be resolved after the war. Through a combination of legislation the president secured and measures taken by his treasury department, the national debt was refinanced and reduced by about one fifth, $435 million, while taxes were reduced by $300 million. During his second term, Grant secured legislation that provided for the resumption of specie payments. The Resumption Act of 1875 restored the country to the gold standard by requiring the redemption of greenbacks and specie on demand starting on January 1st of 1879. Resumption in 1879 was accompanied by a surge in business confidence and a demand for labor, along with an abrupt end to a major depression that had afflicted the country since 1873. I will note one other domestic policy achievement on a different issue, uh, signing into law the establishment of Yellowstone as the first national park and to this day, one of the largest. The Western writer Wallace Stegner would call national parks the best idea we ever had. Yet this was a mere footnote in Grant's own consequential presidency. President Grant's foreign policy uh, achieved significant benchmarks in peace, including the successful resolution of disputes with Spain and Great Britain. He resisted the public clamor for war on three occasions, First, the Cuban rebellion against Spain, which began in 1868, garnered a great deal of sympathy among Americans and pressure from Congress for military intervention on behalf of the rebels. Grant put an end to that possibility with a mention, uh, with a message to Congress in June of 1870, asserting that the Cuban insurgents had no valid claim to be recognized as belligerents. Next was the resolution of the Alabama claims controversy with Great Britain. Now that was just one component of a much broader foreign policy achievement. The CSS Alabama was the most famous of several Confederate ships that were constructed in and set sail from British ports during the Civil War. Although they were built in private shipyards, the British government allowed these ships to escape and inflict a great deal of destruction to Union merchant shipping. After the war, Americans demanded reparations, and the quarrel between the two countries presented the most menacing situation between them since the War of 1812. The terms of settlement of the dispute were provided by the Treaty of Washington, which was signed in 1871 by representatives of the American and the British government. The Alabama claims would be resolved through arbitration by a tribunal that would convene in Geneva, and in 1872, 
award the United States $15.5 million in damages. The treaty also provided for the settlement of a number of other disputes between the United States and Great Britain, including several navigation and trade issues between the United States and Canada. In 1936, John Bassett Moore, a leading authority on international law, called the Treaty of Washington the greatest treaty of actual and immediate arbitration the world had ever seen. Besides marking a turning point in Anglo-American relations and well beyond the immediate importance of the award in favor of the United States, the settlement of the Alabama claims established the principle of international arbitration for the resolution of disputes between nations involving questions of paramount importance. Grant's diplomatic triumph led to several organized efforts that promoted alternatives to war, including the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, and years later, the League of Nations and the United Nations. Yet another episode in which the Grant administration averted war, once again with Spain, was the Virginius Affair. In 1873, the Virginius, a steamer commanded by Captain Joseph Fry, a U.S. citizen and flying the American flag, was captured by the Spanish gunboat Tornado. Claiming that the vessel was aiding Cuban rebels, Spanish military authorities executed 53 prisoners, including Fry and many other Americans. Grant and Fish, uh, his Secretary of State, resisted pressure to declare war on Spain and secured a peaceful resolution of the crisis, including the release of surviving captives and ultimately an $80,000 indemnity from the Spanish government. An investigation into the matter had revealed that the Virginius was illegally registered and had no right to fly the American flag. War with Spain would come 25 years later, but the Grant administration, free of international war, contributed more than any other to the 33 year period between the Civil War and the Spanish-American War, the longest in American history in which the United States without, went without the affliction of a major war. Now Grant had only one major policy initiative defeated by Congress and that came on an early foreign policy issue, his push to annex the Dominican Republic in 1870. Uh, the president's fundamental objectives were certainly grounded in the country's strategic and economic value, but beyond that, Grant hoped that Santo Domingo, as he called the, the Dominican Republic, uh, with the opportunity that it presented to those who emigrated there, would offer African Americans economic leverage to enable them to demand their rights in the southern states on pain of finding them elsewhere. Grant also hoped it would uh, have the effect of doing away with slavery in Cuba and Brazil, where the institution persisted by making slave labor unprofitable. The United States, after all, was slavery's largest supporter by way of the high percentage of exports from those countries to the United States. Well, the Senate defeated the annexation treaty. Now, should presidents receive much credit for their noble objectives on agenda items that failed to carry? Perhaps not. But it is noteworthy that Woodrow Wilson was long celebrated by historians as a lion of internationalism. This despite the fact that his signature goal of the Treaty of Versailles provision of a League of Nations was defeated in the Senate. And despite a widely shared belief that Wilson's own mistakes brought about that outcome. Grant, on the other hand, would get no comparable credit for any of his foreign policy measures that actually succeeded and he got nothing but derision for Santo Domingo. I'll add another word on what became known as Grant's Indian peace policy. When he came to office, he elevated the reform of the government's policy toward Native Americans to a new level of urgency. Over the course of numerous messages, he appealed to the nation's conscience and was blunt about the wickedness of extermination, which he recognized as the likely future if the nation did not change its course. The peace policy emphasized fair dealing and humane treatment and made the federal government directly responsible for the welfare of Native Americans as individuals, departing from a treaty paradigm that too often treated tribes like foreign adversaries. Even beyond that, Grant aimed for their ultimate citizenship. Now, much of his program was assimilationist. On reservations, Native Americans were to be taught agricultural methods and provided sufficient means 
at reasonable costs to pursue them. Over the course of Grant's presidency, a number of medical and educational programs were established for Indian relief. Uh, housing, schools, teachers, cultivated land, and livestock for Native Americans would multiply. Tons of food, clothing, and books were donated by churches and Indian aid organizations. In recent years, the scholarly trend has been to denounce proponents of assimilation, painting all of them, including Grant, with a broad brush as destroyers of culture who had little to nothing of value to show for their efforts. But in his own time, even as the succession of armed conflicts known collectively as the Indian Wars continued during and after Grant's administration, his contemporary critics tended to accuse him of being too lenient and protective toward Native Americans. Lost in the recent commentary is that Grant embraced the most humanitarian views on the political spectrum of his time. Through the first century and a half of American history, up until Franklin Roosevelt's Indian New Deal, no other president had done as much in a humanitarian direction as Grant. When he retired from the White House, a delegation of Choctaws, Chickasaws, Cherokees, and Creeks thanked him for his, quote, just and humane course. Quana Parker, the Comanche chief who had led warriors from three tribes in the Red River War of 1874 to 75, became an advocate of Grant's peace policy among his people. Chief Joseph, who had led warriors in the Nez Perce War months after Grant's retirement, went to New York City to help lead the procession dedicating Grant's tomb in 1897. It is a peculiar reality that these living witnesses of Grant's peace policy appreciated it more than most 21st century scholars of Native American history. Too many historians overlook that on the eve of what could have been a very different fate, Grant helped save Native Americans from extinction. Now Grant would close his presidency by addressing the electoral crisis of 1876 to 77 between Republican Rutherford Hayes and Democrat Samuel Tilden. Threats to the orderly and peaceful inauguration of a new president during that period were more pronounced than at any time in American history other than in 1860 to 61. Grant navigated the crisis by garnering support for the creation of an electoral commission remaining impartial throughout the process, straining, uh, strengthening uh, uh, forces quietly around Washington, and also making clear that disrespect for the law would not be tolerated. That peaceful presidential transition was a significant accomplishment, one made possible by public re recognition of Grant's character, his firmness, and his respect for the law. So we have this record. The peaceful pre presidential transition, 1876 to 77, was a really significant achievement for Grant. It was one that was made possible by public recognition of his character, his firmness, and his respect for the law. So we have this record, uh, but how did historians deal with Grant's achievements apart from reconstruction? For the most part, they ignored them or treated them with contempt. Historians long viewed Grant's economic policy with partisan hostility. Heseltine and Nevins came out with their studies of Grant's presidency at the height of the New Deal. Instead of analyzing those years objectively, they made them into a foil by which to validate the later progressive and New Deal eras. Those who continue to sweep uh, the Grant uh, administration into blanket uh, condemnations of supposed Gilded Age economic oppression overlooked that the period between 1870 and 1940 witnessed a more dramatic improvement in Americans' standard of living than any other period in history. These conditions encouraged massive waves of immigration of those who sought a better future in America. The hostility toward Grant was broad enough and blind enough that 20th century presidential historians who overwhelmingly valued assertive and expansive exercises of presidential power refused to give him credit. Those historians described Grant as a clueless president dominated by Congress who abdicated executive power. Yet this supposedly pliant president vetoed 93 bills, more than all of his predecessors combined with only four of the vetoes overturned. During his second term, he became the first president to call for the power to exercise the line item veto. And he set the chief precedent 
and the argument for the presidential impoundment of funds. More broadly, Grant emerged after an initial period of conflict with Congress as an unusually effective legislative president who was able to advance his agenda in every major area of domestic policy from reconstruction to economic matters and in most areas of foreign policy. In fact, Grant drew much criticism among contemporaries for how much he asserted himself. When historians overlooked this to conjure a passive and ineffective president, it was as if the inherited sense of partisanship against Grant overrode a sense of obligation to do their homework. Great presidents are assertive, poor presidents passive. Grant was a poor president, therefore he must have been passive. And when historians came face to face with what were undeniably achievements in foreign policy, the long tradition of the polemic infused history of the Grant administration somehow assigned credit for foreign policy achievements to Grant's able Secretary of State, Hamilton Fish, while denying it to the president that he served. Historians readily give other presidents credit for achievements made possible by cabinet members on whom they relied at least as much as Grant relied on Fish. This is illustrated by the examples of George Washington and Alexander Hamilton, James Monroe and John Quincy Adams, and Harry Truman and George Marshall, to name just a few pairings. Or looking at subordinates beyond cabinet members, as illustrated by Abraham Lincoln's reliance on General Grant. This is yet another double standard that permeated literature on Grant's presidency. But perhaps the most egregious double standard historians have employed on Grant's presidency is the creation of a corruption narrative to define it. The notion that corruption fundamentally defines and discredits Grant's presidency. In fact, historians picked up this narrative from, from Grant's partisan critics who were wedded to some form of a corruption narrative from the very beginning of Grant's presidency. It did not take any actual evidence for them to uh, produce that narrative. And their definition was hardly limited to the widely accepted definition of corruption, which we can describe as acts of malfeasance or culpable conduct that violates the law for personal or political gain. The corruption narrative at its inception was actually not about Grant's principal subordinates meeting the widely accepted definition of corruption as culpable misconduct. It was about the other ways Gilded Age reformers cast politics as then practiced as a violation of the Republican ideal. Much of the reformers definition referred to the practice of the spoil system, the use of partisan criteria in the distribution of appointments. Yet the spoil system had been in place for generations and was used extensively by Grant's immediate predecessors, notably including Jackson and Lincoln. And while Grant would use patronage power to secure his goals, he would also take pioneering steps to rein in the system. He secured a groundbreaking experiment with a civil service commission, and although the experiment proved temporary, it left the presidency with more power to control the civil service than it had before. Reformers also put under the umbrella of corruption, government extravagance defined as spending beyond the bare minimum needed to advance expenditures the critics deemed essential. But such extravagance would be a strange charge for historians to level against a president like Grant. The federal government ran at a surplus throughout all eight of his years in office and appropriations declined by 25%. Grant's appointees actually introduced reforms to the largest and most troubled realms of government, uh, including, among other measures, new testing standards in the Treasury and Interior Departments, breaking the whiskey tax uh, evasion scheme known as the Whiskey Ring, and significant improvements to the operation of the Post Office Department. Perhaps most ominously, a major part of the definition of corruption held by Grant's contemporary critics was his reconstruction policy, which they deemed a threat to what they viewed as the Republican ideal. Gilded Age critics notoriously viewed themselves as the best men who should have power, and they were repelled by what they saw as heavy-handed militaristic measures to prop up a race that they did not deem fit to share that power. Criticism of Reconstruction became so fused with the corruption narrative that C. Van Woodward regarded Grant's Southern policy as the most conspicuous example of corruption. 
In fact, as the historian Mark Summers has observed in multiple books he has written on the subject of corruption, the post-Civil War federal government was not more corrupt than it was during the 1850s, and the period of Grant's administration did not mark a shift from honesty to depravity. But much of the prior and subsequent corruption in government has gone into an amnesia hole, conveniently forgotten in favor of other themes historians prefer to emphasize for other presidencies. When the context is Grant, historians employed a panoply of double standards, treat the president's own abundant integrity as a non-issue, highlight any Gilded Age corruption that can build a lurid narrative, disregard how removed from presidential decision-making or from the executive branch altogether, actual misconduct is. Ignore whether the conduct predated the administration or whether the administration itself rooted it out. Guilt by association is fair game. Treat innuendo like established fact. Downgrade errors in judgment to malfeasance. When Grant's subordinates went after corruption or pursued other reformative measures with his knowledge and support, detach credit from the president. When a subordinate misstepped, assign the president blame even though the conduct occurred out of presidential sight and was divorced from presidential directives. In short, layer hostile inference upon hostile inference to reach the most hostile conclusion. So when Grant foiled Jay Gould and Jim Fisk's scheme to corner the gold market in 1869, generations of historians working with hostile and unreliable sources distorted Grant's role. Their takeaway was not a presidential accomplishment, but an item to log as a scandal. The same with the Credit Mobilier scandal. That involved the unseemly sale of shares of stock of the company that had financed the construction of the Union Pacific Railroad to several members of Congress at bargain prices. It had occurred in a different branch of government and even prior to Grant's inauguration. The corruption narrative was queued up to make the most of whatever allegations arose in connection with Grant's cabinet or other principal appointees. But it was not until his second term that opponents could find such targets and they nearly always fell short of demonstrating the official's malfeasance. An attorney general, George Williams, bought a fancy carriage that was used for social calls and negligently allowed the Justice Department's chief clerk to handle his personal accounts in a way that effectively resulted in improper advances in pay. But these lapses were common and did not lead to personal profit. Williams's wife may have been a different story as she was reported to have solicited a bribe. Now Grant's second secretary of the treasury, William Richardson, negligently signed off on an opportunist's profitable and, as it turned out, unnecessary contracts with his department to seek out delinquent taxes for a 50% commission. But Richardson had been deceived on what appeared to be routine and inconsequential contracts. He was not looking to profit and broke no law. Grant's second secretary of the interior, Columbus Delano, was blamed for his son's attempt to profit off shady surveying uh, contracts without doing work, but the secretary himself was an honest man. One of Grant's private secretaries in the White House, Orville Babcock, was indicted for conspiracy in connection with the whiskey ring. He was acquitted, not contrary to some accounts because of a deposition Grant submitted in his defense, but because the evidence against him was insufficient for conviction. He was, at a minimum, guilty of serious lapses in judgment and ended up being demoted to a position as inspector of lighthouses. But the belief that he lacked criminal intent to engage in bribery was widespread. The next three presidents after Grant kept Babcock on the federal payroll, and Chester Arthur actually nominated him for a military promotion before he died by drowning. Grant's Secretary of War, William Belknap, was the one cabinet member who presented a strong case for malfeasance, what appeared to be bribes his first wife had arranged in connection with a lucrative Indian post tradership. Grant quickly accepted Belknap's resignation, but a rabidly partisan Democratic House of Representatives went ahead and impeached him anyway. Ultimately, the Senate acquitted him because a substantial margin of senators thought they lacked jurisdiction over a former official. Grant's critics accused him of trying to save his subordinate from being held accountable for his actions in an impeachment trial. 
The Starians would long repeat that criticism, which is based on a premise that is demonstrably false. In no other instance in history has a cabinet member or any other executive branch appointee been impeached. In no other case has history held a president delinquent for not keeping potentially impeachment worthy subordinates in office in order to subject them to the impeachment process. Additionally, Grant ordered his attorney general to prosecute Belknap. But while Belknap probably was guilty of at least willful blindness to the underlying transaction, the evidence left too much doubt as to his knowledge and criminal intent to convict him. Grant recognized most of these cases as involving errors in judgment, even when they did not involve criminal conduct, and apologized for it in his eighth annual message issued at the end of a year that included the Babcock trial and the Belknap impeachment. On the subject of, of appointments who made such mistakes, Grant wrote, quote, history shows that no administration from the time of Washington to the present has been free from these mistakes, but I leave comparisons to history. But historians have not been particularly interested in making such comparisons. They have not found the misdeeds of subordinates, whether real or hyped, to be a fundamental component in the assessment of any president, unless that president was named Grant or Harding. Not coincidentally, two presidents historians long considered politically unsympathetic. Consider one rare survey of presidential misconduct originally compiled by C. Van Woodward during the Nixon impeachment inquiry in 1974, with a dozen historians contributing individual chapters on each president. One of those historians, James Banner, edited an updated version of that study in 2019. He said, and this is a direct quote, to write the history of presidencies through misconduct is completely to misconstrue the nature of presidencies. Let's take Harry Truman's presidency as an example. Truman's presidency was one of the most corrupt in the 20th century. Now, Banner continued that the real story of that presidency consisted of policy issues like the Berlin airlift and the Marshall Plan, and quote, if you try to write the history of the Truman administration on the grounds of the misconduct of the White House, then you're really, you're not really writing the history of the Truman administration. Indeed, influence peddling marred a host of offices in the executive branch under Truman, including a major tax fraud conspiracy involving the bribery of government officials, ultimately leading to high profile criminal convictions. Consider just a few examples of how different presidential history would look if instead of applying what we can call the banner standard that applies to nearly every president, we searched for a tabloid level screed of scandal that was, as was done for so many years to tar Grant's presidency. George Washington was embarrassed by revelations that he had repeatedly overdrawn his salary during both of his terms and his second secretary of the treasury took the blame. Washington's first secretary of the treasury, Alexander Hamilton, chose as assistant secretary, a notorious speculator who sought private gain from inside information and after leaving office, triggered a financial panic fueled by money he owed the government. That was far from Hamilton's only scandal, but historians not only refuse to hold any of it against Washington as president, they are also fine with recognizing Hamilton as belonging in or near the top of the pantheon of the greatest cabinet members ever. Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson handed out what appeared to be a political sinecure, a part-time position as a translator in the State Department to someone who proceeded to launch an anti-administration newspaper. Secretary of State and former Attorney General Edmund Randolph, who succeeded Jefferson, resigned after casting the government he served into disrepute amid highly sensitive domestic and diplomatic challenges, uh, though fellow cabinet members probably went too far accusing Randolph of treasonously soliciting a bribe from the French government to instigate civil strife. Most of Abraham Lincoln's cabinet members were severely criticized early in his presidency with the war, Navy, Treasury, and Interior Departments suffering irregularities that their heads had varying levels of difficulty controlling. Perhaps the worst of them was Secretary of War Simon Cameron, whose department was at the forefront of fighting what of course would become the bloodiest war in American history. 
While often remembered as corrupt, there was no proof of malfeasance on his part, but his offense was a recognized incompetence in overseeing a department that was plagued by waste and fraud. Mary Todd Lincoln's extravagance, overrunning the budget for White House furnishings, has long been recognized by Lincoln biographers, even if as a footnote to the president's story, but her extravagance paled next to her outright corruption. Among other things, she procured falsified bills in order to extract money from the public treasury and accepted bribes for a range of influence peddling activity that included leaking parts of Lincoln's 1861 annual message before it was issued. It is unnecessary to speculate how differently historians would have approached anything like the same fact, fact pattern if it were to exist uh, in the case of Ulysses and Julia Grant, because even in the absence of such circumstances, history's condemnation was unsparing. When the Watergate scandal brought down Richard Nixon in 1974, historians had an exemplar of actual malfeasance by a president. From his cover-up of the Watergate break-in, which included discussions about paying hush money to the burglars, to the broader abuse of power to sabotage political enemies. That was corruption at an order of magnitude greater than prior presidencies. Yet the 1982 presidential poll of PhD holding members of college history departments placed Nixon above both Grant and Harding, which suggests a widespread institutionalized misunderstanding of historical facts an inability to differentiate levels of culpability or both. At one point, a strong ideological skew among historians against Ronald Reagan almost did him in. Commentators took an interest in bribery and related crimes in the Pentagon and the Department of Housing and Urban Development and negligence and other lapses by a number of subordinates. Most conspicuous was the covert illegal scheme orchestrated by the White House-based National Security Council and the Central Intelligence Agency to sell arms to the terrorist supporting Iranian government and to divert pro proceeds from the arms sales to the anti-communist Contras in Nicar Nicaragua. Amid the disclosure of the Iran-Contra affair, American Heritage Magazine ran uh, an article by uh, Irwin Fredwin, Fredman that put Reagan in the same category as Grant, Harding, and Nixon. This was complete with a cartoon uh, that showed the four presidents falling into a hellish fiery pit. Yet at that time, none other than C. Van Woodward expressed a change of heart about Grant when asked to compare the incumbent administration with its predecessors. He wrote in a letter to another historian in reference to Grant and the scandals of that era, quote, our prevailing picture of the Gilded Age is preposterous, a howling anachronism. Revision, replacement, vindication, updating, call it what you will, but it is the most pressing duty facing American historians. After other historians and commentators fought back with correctives on Reagan's foreign and domestic policy achievements, the 40th president would later attain consistent marks in the C-SPAN poll's top 10. But Woodward's latter-day epiphany regarding the howling anachronism of the Grant corruption narrative should be shared by more than the handful of historians who agreed with that insight. For an even starker illustration of historians' inconsistency, consider how readily they discount corrupt activity when it occurs with the participation of the presidents themselves, with the exception of Nixon. While the arbitrary and abusive deployment of government agencies against political adversaries or others who evoked political suspicions is remembered as a consummately Nixonian brand of corruption, Franklin Roosevelt, John Kennedy, and Lyndon Johnson had sanctioned such activity. This was often done through the Internal Revenue Service and under Kennedy and Johnson, increasingly involved the FBI and the CIA. Grant never engaged in any such conduct. Perhaps even more telling is historian's treatment of Bill Clinton. Regardless of whether or not he is held to have deserved impeachment over the Lewinsky scandal, the fact is that he acted with moral turpitude, lied to the public, broke the law, reflecting a level of corruption at the presidential level that was entirely absent from the Grant administration. Historians certainly remember Clinton's failing, but in the C-SPAN polls conducted since he left the White House, Clinton has been ranked steadily in the upper half of presidents and consistently above Grant, suggesting that the corruption issue has not taken any comparable toll on his reputation. 
As for Clinton subordinates, it is practically forgotten that five Clinton cabinet members faced independent counsel investigations and a sixth who did not face such an investigation was asked to resign. So for all the correction that has occurred for Grant's reputation, much of the incongruous standard that long applied to Grant persists. Today, no longer can a summary of the Grant administration be presented that omits reconstruction or employs the Dunning era condemnation, but the same summary could be expected to omit with impunity the Alabama claims, the Virginia's affair, and gold resumption, while it could not omit some form of the corruption narrative without seeming incomplete. Presidential historians who have not focused on Grant should have tried much more than they have to apply the same judicious approach to all presidencies. Historians should also revise their assessments of presidents on the subject of war and peace. While they have long been apt to elevate several presidents who have gone to war for the transformative impact of their conflicts, if they fail to do the same for presidents who achieve significant benchmarks in peace, as Grant certainly did, they will miss a critical aspect of statesmanship, not to mention providing the worst incentives to future presidents who seek history's ultimate approval. Historians should also be less dismissive of those who attained 19th century economic policy goals. Sometimes fame at a particular moment in history does not age well with perspective. Well, not so in Grant's case. For all of his late 19th century adulation, he ultimately would be denied a place in the presidential pantheon for the wrong reasons. 150 years after he occupied the White House, this should be clearer than it was to generations of leaders who followed him without taking as courageous a stand on behalf of the nation's highest ideals. Grant's bicentennial is an occasion to break through the last vestiges of historical vilification and to regard him as part of Americans' pantheon of great presidents. So I thank you for uh, listening. And I know we've uh, run uh, rather long, but I'm glad to stick around for any questions uh, if you have time to uh, address them. Um, I'm glad uh, you'll take some questions. Um, wow, um, I'd like to echo Rod Ross's comment. Um, he says, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. That was uh, simply amazing, uh, Frank. Thank you very much. Everybody's on mute or you'd hear big round of applause. Um, I'd like to open it up to uh, Fergus and uh, John Anderson. They have some questions and we have some others, but I do want to uh, mention uh, at the outset when you were uh, talking about um, what I call the chicken or the egg story, what came first, the, uh, the, the Emancipation Proclamation or all the actions of uh, presidents after the fact. And uh, indeed, um, it, it wasn't the Emancipation Proclamation was perhaps that th that uh, spark, but um, it needed to be implemented, and uh, certainly he did. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Lincoln said in the Gettysburg Address, he said, um, "I'll butcher this, but I'll, I'll just go ahead and say it. You know, for us to be dedicated here to the great task remaining before us, to take increased devotion to that cause." that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. And it certainly means that a lot of people had to do a lot more after Lincoln started that started us down that road to that new birth of freedom. Um, and your talk emphasizes um, that the task is, it's a pretty big task to protect democracy. Uh, there is a lot to it. Um, it requires, requires um, us to study history, but more importantly, to study the writing of history and what the ulterior motives are of some historical writings and of course some political analyses that go along with it. Um, a historian's job is never done and academic's job is never done. So anybody who says what, they know everything they need to know about history, just listen to you and you see there's so much more to learn. Um, thank you very much for such a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, uh, uh, Fergus, if you could unmute yourself and uh, start us off with the questions. Uh, Fergus is a prior member. I don't know if you're back from California yet, but 
Uh, he's an author and written some wonderful books uh, about the Underground Railroad, also about um, Congress in 1850. He's given us a talk and he's uh, written a book. Uh, one of my favorite ones is about uh, the construction of the Capitol and all the history behind that. So Fergus, go ahead and uh, if you want to ask our speakers some questions. Uh, thanks, Kurt. Uh, uh, Frank, thanks very, very much for a terrific talk. Really excellent. And uh, I, I, I'm going to preface my, my comment or question uh, just by saying that, that I wholly agree with you and, and, and congratulate you on your, your determination to help, help uh, restore Grant uh, to a position that he really deserves to be in. Um, that said, um, I think we all, uh, I'm speaking globally here, but we, we all have a, a tendency, I think, uh, to think of presidents as acting independently and then almost as if they existed in a vacuum without taking into account the difficulty of legislating anything, uh, of, of bringing any kind of policy to fruition, and certainly the virtual impossibility of bringing policy to fruition without some kind of consensus and support in Congress. Okay, so... Uh, I, I don't particularly want to derail you into talking about Grant and Congress because it's a very complicated and, uh, and uh, uh, subject and a moving target. So let me focus on this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm inclined to say that I think Grant could have and should have used more of his political capital to maintain and increase the number of federal occupation troops in the South. He deserves, deserves a great deal of credit uh, moral courage, for his moral courage in supporting civil rights and and uh, uh, the cause of the freed people and so on. But nonetheless, uh, the the uh, federal occupation petered out until there was a, a minuscule and pathetic handful of troops to actually protect the freed people and their exercise of rights. And I would extend the same point to say, I think he should also have used political capital to significantly enlarge the Justice Department uh, in order to prosecute more of the many hundreds of Klansmen uh, who, after 1871, were indicted, arrested and indicted, but frankly never went to jail because there weren't enough prosecutors and public opinion and congressional support eroded. So, um, I, I'm interested in anything you'd care to say on that kind of bundle of, of, of thought. Sure, and thanks for your question. By the way, thanks for your wonderful scholarship, which I've really enjoyed, uh, not to mention your uh, book reviews for the Wall Street Journal. I hope there are more coming. Uh, Thank so you uh, raise a very uh, important uh, uh, factor about there being this broader context uh, that uh, governs what is possible. Politics is always the art of the possible. And we do tend to overstate what presidents alone uh, can do, uh, is they do have to uh, account for where the population is, and of course, in turn, where their elected representatives in Congress are. The you look at the timeline, what Grant did in his prosecution of the Klan between 1871 and 1872, I think was sweeping. There were hundreds of indictments. And it's true, a lot of the sentences were relatively short, but intense and what you might call pro uh, controversial uh, uh, legal action by the government uh, usually relies on political shock effects as much as it does actual conviction figures for the impact that it has. And the Klan really was crushed by the end of 1872. Not that there weren't these other groups that then sprouted up and used some Klan tactics and uh, combined them with uh, more subtle uh, uh, forms of intimidation uh, and you know, with the game of disfranchisement. Uh, but of course, the Klan that we have today really originated in 1915. It's the, the way the political uh, realities went, and you look at what was politically viable at any one point. Grant was pounded uh, again and again for what seemed militaristic 
and overly repressive, even if it seems light to modern eyes. Uh, and by the mid 1870s, you had a bunch of people who had a strong record and frankly, deeper roots in racial equality because Grant was not an abolitionist before the war, but you even had his vice president, Henry Wilson, who had impeccable credentials as a great abolitionist senator from Massachusetts before he became vice president, uh, thinking Grant was going too far. Uh, and what happened, it, it's, there are a whole bunch of things that are going on. I didn't talk about what the court was doing uh, because that's a whole other layer of factors. But in 1873, you had this, one of the awful episodes of racial violence was the Colfax massacre in Louisiana, which was followed by decisive prosecutorial action, even though it, uh, the prosecutions uh, secured three convictions. But there was a period of time after that, that violence in the South had calmed down. Uh, African-American voting rates were, were, they were certainly at a place where they had not been ever in American history, not even in pre immediately preceding years. They would not be anywhere uh, like that uh, for a while. Um, but there was a period of an uneasy uh, uh, calm, if you want to put it uh, that way, that it seemed that this violence uh, was subsiding. It seemed that biracial democracy was in fact functioning. And then you had what I point out in the, the book that I wrote called The Supreme Court's Retreat from Reconstruction. You have several justices of the Supreme Court who basically in, in a few instances, I would say flip-flopped from their early views that were more expansive about congressional power to prosecute, or to address uh, civil rights violations. And starting with Justice Bradley's circuit opinion, throwing out the uh, uh, convictions that had been attained for the Colfax massacre, and then that would, uh, was a decision that would be uh, adopted, uh, affirmed by the full Supreme Court in 1876. You had these developments that kept Southerners who were recalcitrant from the beginning, it, it left them determined to do whatever they could to resist reconstruction, to try to overturn this new biracial order. The fact of the matter is though, uh, if you look at the political realities, troops should not have been in the South at all as late as 1877. And although I didn't get into this level of weeds when we talk about Hayes withdrawing the troops in 1877, though the withdrawal of the troops was not the product of an 11th hour bargain to try to get Hayes uh, uh, to, to win the electoral votes that were in dispute over Tilden, that was actually a political reality that nearly everyone had acknowledged for a couple of years at that point. Uh, as early as 1875, uh, Hayes was on record as saying, you know, military intervention of the South cannot uh, continue. Um, he made, when he was a candidate, he, he stated maybe a, little, a bit more subtly, he made it clear where he was. And it's remarkable that uh, the troops, even though it doesn't seem like much to us because we look at the withdrawal of troops and, and we know in retrospect that meant Jim Crow, but it wasn't immediately obvious to people at the time what the withdrawal of troops would mean. In fact, there was even at the time a number of African American leaders who uneasily uh, assented to Hayes's withdrawal of the troops because they, they understood political realities, but they hoped that if things regressed to a, a worse state of affairs, that the troops would come back. What was lost, what Grant did that was immediately repudiated was the use of troops because it was so politically toxic, it was so controversial. But the notion of the reconstruction amendments themselves or, or uh, suffrage, those were not lost uh, for several years, for a full generation after Grant was in office. His immediate successors really did want to see the votes, it's votes of black men that we're talking about, of course, but they wanted to see those votes somehow protected. And I think part of it stemmed from 
being invested in the Civil War and seeing that as part of what Union uh, victory meant. You have a bunch of Civil War uh, veterans, generals even, who were serving as Republican presidents, 1870s and 80s after, uh, after Grant. But also there's the political reality. If you're losing Black Republican votes in the South, it's going to hurt the party. So even by crass political calculations, uh, this, this seemed like, you know, this is a good thing to, to pursue, which is why you had the 1200 voting rights prosecutions that were, uh, that, that picked up, uh, especially in, in, under Garfield and, uh, and Arthur. But just about every question that reconstruction historians consider when they think of, well, what if, could this have been done this way or that, could different things have been done you know, the politicians of that time, they were no dopes and they thought about just about everything that we would think about, they thought about it. But military uh, intervention, I think was off the table because it was just too politically toxic. It was comparable to uh, Americans' uh, opposition to the Vietnam War, or if you wanna draw analogies to Iraq and Afghanistan, perhaps when they became more controversial. Uh, some sometimes historians ask, well, why couldn't there have been something like a Marshall Plan uh, that was, well, Rutherford Hayes thought, let's, let's pursue public war. They didn't call it a Marshall Plan. George Marshall wasn't quite born yet, but uh, why not pursue something like a, a Southern uh, transcontinental railroad, throw some money uh, that way and maybe, and, and also some patronage on, you know, to white Southern Democrats, maybe that'll help. It didn't, it was a failure. Uh, vote, black voting rates free fall uh, after the 1876 election when you go to the Hayes, the, the elections over which Hayes provided 1878 and 1880. Garfield, who was in office too short a time to really leave much of a legacy, he had a wonderful idea. This was part of Grant's idea. Education is the key. And in fact, the establishment of free public education su supported by the states was a great accomplishment of the various reconstruction state governments that would plant the seeds, but it would take generations for that to really grow. But in, in, uh, that provided fertile soil for the generation that eventually uh, succeeded with the civil rights movement of the 20th century. Uh, but then you had, uh, you know, there was not demonstrable uh, uh, progress uh, during that time. Chester Arthur had his own uh, strategy of uh, trying to form coalitions, biracial coalitions, maybe, but one way or another, let's try to get coalitions with independent factions in the South to get a, a Southern Republican Party back uh, in motion. Uh, Benjamin Harrison tried to revive a Grant era tactic by pushing a federal elections bill that would protect voting rights in federal elections, but the bill died in 1891. Sometimes historians ask, uh, and it, there's some point to this, that the financial depression of the 1870s helped, it distracted Americans from Reconstruction, made them more impatient with uh, Reconstruction. But you know, even into the 1880s, when there was mostly prosperity, other than a brief depression in 1884, it was mostly a boom decade, uh, Republican leaders, whether presidents or members of Congress, were just not able to ever reach the place that Grant had reached. And, and I, it's part of my point that Grant towers above other presidents because you, it's not just one president. There's a generation that would like to see something done about this. And for all of the disappointing things that happened, Grant uh, towers above the others. And when you're talking about, even though presidents, are, it's often all overrated how much they can do. If we're talking about presidents in relative terms, um, that's part of the argument for why Grant belongs in the Pantheon. And I'll just close, I apologize for the filibustering long answer on this question, but it is a very rich one. The Hartford Current in the summer of 1876 uh, had an editorial that said, you know, Grant is now as staunch an advocate for this recent revolution in equal rights. He's as staunch as anybody, as staunch as Charles Sumner ever was. Uh, he's the champion. He is now ahead of like there was no faction that was more egalitarian than Grant uh, in, when you reach the, the latter part of his presidency. That's a reflection of where he is. He carried the country as far as he could uh, along the spectrum. But I think subsequent history only un underscores the impossibility and the lack of political viability of doing more.
uh, with a, a beefed up uh, military uh, presence. So uh, if there's another question, I certainly have time if others uh, do. I do uh, thank you for your patience, by the way. I know it, uh, we've run on for a long time, but. Uh, it's, yeah. it's absolutely great questions and great answers. Don't worry about that. Uh, John um, Anderson, if you uh, want to open your mic and ask your questions. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was, I, I think Grant had sort of a particular animosity for, for, for Johnson. And I, I often wonder if Grant had actually, uh, uh, he got off to a bad start because of Johnson, if you will, with respect to the reconstruction. Had Grant actually been able to uh, be, uh, uh, succeed Lincoln, okay, such that he could have, in effect, continued that Lincoln policy of integration, if you will. And you can kind of argue that it was a little loose to some degree, maybe Lincoln could have pulled it off. But clearly Johnson, you know, was not the right person at all. And then Grant really had it in for Johnson. And so I wonder, um, that's the one question. And the second question, without taking a lot of time, is as you know, uh, I'm the guy out in California and with the uh, bust of uh, Ulysses S. Grant being taken down in the Golden Gate uh, Park. My question is, um, how, do we, how do we get this message into the, the educational system? Because, you know, and you and I have gone back and forth a few times over this, uh, we have people taking the statue down, and here's one of the great champions of, of uh, c civil rights. And so it, how do we do that? So those are two questions, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, John, and thank you, by the way, for uh, helping us being our, uh, with our outreach to the authorities uh, who run Golden Gate Park. We're hoping that the toppled grant bust will be restored sometime soon. And to start with your second question, I think that a number of the recent uh, biographies, I'll start with Ron Chernow, even though that may be the most recent of the definitive biographies, although Chuck Calhoun's comprehensive uh, account of Grant's presidency is really magnificent. Chernow's is the best selling, and I think that's been permeating the historical consciousness. Students of history are noticing uh, that Grant, this is a major theme, I think, of, uh, of Chernow's biography, that he was a champion of human rights. Uh, this is a message that he is uh, conveying. And it's, a, it's something that should uh, filter down to uh, grade school, to high school. I mean, every layer of history, I mean, it's, it's I find it crazy. I grew up in you know, the 1980s, I was in grammar school and high school. It's, it's like, 20 something years after the civil rights movement, and I'm still getting in my history textbooks, a largely Dunning influenced interpretation of reconstruction. Um, I think it's important for uh, people who develop the curricula at the primary and secondary level to really do more of their homework and, and incorporate these basic facts, these base, really important facts into their curriculum. Now, on uh, Andrew Johnson uh, succeeding Lincoln, which of course could be in a, a talk unto itself. So if Grant had somehow come in instead of Andrew Johnson immediately in 1865, one of those uh, what if questions, he might have operated a lot like Abraham Lincoln, uh, which is not to overlook that by the spring of 1865, neither Lincoln, I don't think really knew precisely what he was going to do how he wanted reconstruction to play out. And Grant certainly had a couple of years to really sort out his perception. It took him a while to, uh, to see, but he learned during those Johnson years that uh, resistance to, uh, to the uh, emancipation of uh, the enslaved people was going to take uh, a, a lot less, it was gonna be a lot less Southern cooperation that stronger measures were needed. So by 1867, you know, two years into it, he's convinced, okay, suffrage is going to be necessary. Um, I could, this is more of an Andrew Johnson question than anything else, because Johnson was in some ways this aberration. I mean, there's a historical moment that is taking place. Emancipation, the obvious logical next step is to confer uh, the emancipated slave with equal rights to sort of define those equal rights from scratch. And Johnson winds up 
going against that current in history. And it's in resistance to that before Grant had his horrible, toxic relationship with Johnson. Of course, Johnson had a horrible, toxic relationship with radical re Republicans and then also moderate Republicans in Congress. The interesting thing, when you look at the black codes that uh, arose in the Southern states, the former Confederate states after the Civil War, and then, well, Congress has to, you know, these black codes are stripping former slaves of all of these basic rights and essentially restoring them to de facto slavery. Congress has to do something to act. Well, it surprised people when Johnson vetoed the Civil Rights Act because it really seemed like the sort of measure that was intuitive that probably would have gotten Lincoln's support. It's hard to imagine any Republican, and of course Johnson was a Democrat who would join the National Union uh, uh, ticket, the, the fusion ticket, if you will, in 1864. But it's hard to think of any typical Republican, Hannibal Hamlin, even if you put in Ulysses Grant, I, in 1865, 66, it's hard to imagine any of them vetoing the Civil Rights Act of 1866. One of the interesting things about those four years is as Andrew Johnson is pushing back and recalcitrant Southerners are pushing back, Congress responds with a whole new amendment, really two new amendments, right? Uh, but starting with the 14th Amendment, then there's the 15th Amendment because Congress realizes we're going to need something. We're going need to need a super statute. We're going to need a law that no future Congress can overturn. This is serious business here. One of the interesting things about that counterfactual, for all of the damage that Andrew Johnson had done, and I cannot name another president who did more damage to the country than Andrew Johnson, ironically, it's possible that we would not have had a 14th and 15th Amendment in the Constitution. If things had gone more swimmingly, you had a sympathetic Republican president, um, who knows, uh, they might have just seen, okay, we have a bunch of statutes that are passing uh, there probably would have been military reconstruction still. I think there still would have been pushback. Who knows if we would have had uh, those amendments. So maybe the, the, if you, uh, the toxic relationships are never a thing to celebrate in Washington, but sometimes uh, those intense clashes could, read, uh, could lead to results that really help the country in the long, long term. And indeed, of course, Dred Scott itself would only be overturned by a horrible, bloody civil war that uh, overturned that uh, Dred Scott through the 13th Amendment and, and the other two reasons. You have Grant there in, in the face of everything you just said, who, who just uh, uh, presided over the loss of a million dead, actually fought the war. And here it is un unraveling in some way. So you, you, you could see you could see uh, the gen the, a general uh, saying, well, look, everything we fought for, died for, maybe is at stake here. And, and so you, I, I always felt that he, he was getting particularly enraged as time went on and Johnson was acting or not acting. Uh, and so you, you could see how, you know, did, maybe he even was encouraged to run for president. I agree, John. That's why I mentioned the uh, Gettysburg Address there. Yeah. I don't um, mean to take, take more time. Thank you, Frank. No, thank you. And uh, I'm going to uh, ask Rod Ross to speak, but but I want to give Bryce a heads up that I'm going to call on you as a history professor in history in uh, Minnesota of high school students, what your thoughts are. But uh, Rod, if you could ask first, and then I see we have a question from John Swallow that uh, like to, he's with the Lincoln Group of DC. Um, so uh, be prepared, John, afterwards, and then Bryce. Go ahead, Brett. Right. So Frank, it was brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. But I'm curious why you didn't give credence that Charles Calhoun does to the, the incredible effect of Henry Adams and that ilk. People, the, the, from my childhood, the liberal Republicans who who were the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people of the world because Grant did not uh, give them the uh, credence and the offices that they would have liked. They viciously, viciously turned on him. And Charles Sumner really had no good things to say about Grant. Why did you not mention those two individuals, especially 
in talking about the low, low status of grant till recently? Thank you for your question, Rod. And what a good question, uh, because the answer is, I do talk about them. I talk about them a lot in the Fuller essay, which uh, I'll do the screen share again here for shameless book plug. Um, as I was preparing uh, the talk, I realized I had to slice a lot. It was already kind of running long. And unfortunately, Henry Adams was lost in the mix, but there's a lot of Henry Adams and disgruntled office seekers. And it's a very important point you make about these Gilded Age reformers who deemed themselves the best men, that a lot of it uh, there was this confirmation bias that was built in. It was in part uh, being angry that they and their ilk were not receiving uh, jobs and uh, the influence that they, they wanted uh, in the grant administration. Uh, there was cultural prejudice involved there too, to be sure. And this manifested itself. So you have Henry Adams, who many regard as the greatest American historian any, ever, anywhere. Um, and then C. Van Woodward, who's many regard as the greatest uh, 20th century historian, both of them play a prominent role in the essay that I wrote in this book. Uh, but it's, it was quite candidly just uh, to make this uh, presentation uh, of manageable uh, length. Um, and, and I should say, incidentally, I'm glad you mentioned Chuck Calhoun's book because it really is the definitive narrative of Grant's presidency. I wrote a short book on Grant's presidency in 1998, and I thought it was time to write about his presidency again because there was a quarter century of additional scholarship that took place, and let's take measure of Grant's standing. To some extent, uh, what I wrote in this essay, which is entitled President Grant Belongs in the Pantheon, is a sequel to many of the really rich observations that Chuck Calhoun made about this early generation of Gilded Age reformers and how that confirmation bias uh, played out in, uh, in history. And I talk a, a bit more about uh, these 20th century historians, people like Heseltine and Nevins. I even talk about Thomas Bailey, whose American pageant may be the best selling American history textbook anywhere. So I'm not cherry picking names of the people who said, just because they sounded obnoxious about Grant, these were the most influential historians of the 20th century. And William McFeely may not have quite been in that category, but to this day, his biography of Grant was the only biography of Grant to win the Pulitzer Prize. And Alan Nevins's hatchet job on Grant's administration, uh, although it was cast as, uh, in, in some ways, uh, a valuable biography of Hamilton Fish, was another book that won the Pulitzer. And none of these other recent books, even though I think several of them were Pulitzer worthy, quite had that distinction. And that's that's a reason, this goes to an earlier question too, and, and to my entire talk, of course, of why it's so difficult. Like why are, are the uh, uh, attitudes about Grant so deeply entrenched? You know, Some should say to me, well, look, the Grant was all the way at the bottom Shouldn't we be satisfied that he's now in the middle? And uh, my, my response is, uh, look, at, let's try to act from a clean slate here. You really do have, things should go 180 degrees uh, in the other direction, uh, in part because of tendencies like recasting reconstruction as 180 degrees in the other direction of what it really was. Thank you, Frank. Uh, and, and you're a uh, commercial for new, new historians so, and uh, people getting a degree in history and political science. Um, John uh, Swallow, do you uh, want to go ahead with your question? Well, uh, Rod asked it, uh, asked it very well. I, I'm curious, uh, you know, and we've, the Lincoln Group has read about the quarter of Calhoun. How is it that Sumner and Henry Adams could have such an incredible impact? And in, you know, they're criticizing Grant, the Grant Grant administration. It you know as it's happening, how they how their influence could influence historians fifty and <laughs> 60, 70, 80, 90 years later. Well, they're just two individuals. 
Well, it's not uh, just two individuals. They were part of the New England, we use a modern term, the intelligentsia of the time, the people who were the most literate, the people who were editors of so many of the country's newspapers, people who, as one historian pointed out, while Grant's allies were building railroads and managing conventions, these guys, many of whom were out of power, were writing these screeds against the administration. And one of the, I hate to say that this is a, a lesson because it's kind of a negative lesson some could draw from the Grant years uh, or, or from the presidency in general is, well, don't alienate the intelligentsia if you want to be fondly remembered as a president. I mean, that's one of the takeaways you can take from this because elite opinion, uh, much of elite opinion really was against Grant from the beginning. But the interesting thing is they really didn't gain political traction in their time. I mean, in 1872, you had enough elites who were furious with Grant to actually have a breakaway because they were not gonna become Democrats, but they had this breakaway liberal Republican party because they couldn't support Grant's uh, reelection. And they nominate Horace Greeley who had played a real role in the founding of the Republican party. He winds up being jointly uh, uh, endorsed by this breakaway Republic, you know, part of the Republican Party plus the Democratic Party. That never happened in the history of presidential elections, that a major party has a fusion ticket with this breakaway third party. And Greeley gets trounced, the biggest landslide between Andrew Jackson and Theodore Roosevelt. Um, they would get their revenge in a sense by, in the words of William Heseltine, stuffing the ballot boxes of history. And while uh, there were certainly New, New England intelligent, well, maybe you will call them the intelligentsia, but they were very, very bright people like George Boutwell of Massachusetts, who was uh, Grant's secretary of uh, the treasury earlier, uh, was one of the framers of reconstruction legislation uh, and later uh, was a distinguished uh, sen senator. You had people like that who were staunch Grant allies and left some wonderful uh, recollections of, uh, of that period. But historians uh, were swayed by, it was a minority view that wound up becoming a majority view among those who write the history, who identified with this elite opinion shared many of their prejudices, of course, most uh, horribly and invidiously their racial prejudices, uh, but also the cultural prejudice about this upstart Westerner that you know, is gaining this power. Sumner, uh, I will mention too, because he certainly had a great deal of power. He's arguably the most prestigious Senator of that period. Sumner is uh, an idiosyncratic guy, and he may never have really recovered fully from the caning that he got during the 1850s, uh, but he could be difficult, ornery, and he had a stratospheric sense of entitlement. Uh, Grant had given him quite a lot. He, he even uh, designated a, a Sumner person as minister to Britain, a very important diplomatic post but it wasn't enough for Sumner, who I think wanted to be Secretary of State, perhaps even wanted to be president. And uh, there were some people who just, Sumner's ego uh, got in the way of, a, it, sometimes he was his own worst enemy. And Grant was politically astute enough to note this. He would note things like, you know what, Charles Sumner for all of his egalitarianism was actually did not vote for the 15th amendment. I mean, he thought he wanted the amendment to be broader than it was, but he would sometimes do things that were self-defeating and he wound up, uh, the, 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 the psychologist or psychiatrist turned commentator, Charles Krauthammer had coined the term Bush derangement syndrome, you know, about 20 years ago during the Bush administration. Fact is there are a bunch of presidents whose opponents had what you can call a derangement syndrome and I think Sumner was one of the people who suffered from it. And that's why this, a man who really was a champion of egalitarianism, I can't take that away from Charles Sumner. Uh, one of his less uh, exalted moments is going along with this 1872 fusion ticket that blasts Grant uh, for being heavy handed and militaristic and, and basically uh, looking to undermine uh, these measures that were needed for reconstruction to, uh, to stick. Thank you, Frank. Uh, we'll go to Bryce now, but uh, 
do want to emphasize the problems with the prejudice that you're talking about. It's not limited to history, but it also sometimes affects uh, economics and education and sometimes even the sciences. That's um, yeah, uh, Bryce, do you, uh, I wanted to call on you because uh, Bryce is now teaching history up in Minnesota to high school students. And I wanted your take on um, what, you're, what you're seeing in high school about uh, the teaching of Grant yourself or from others. Uh, you're, on, you're on mute still, Bryce. And Bryce will be a speaker uh, for, with us um, uh, later on this year too. Go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kurt, uh, for asking me to contribute and thank you to our presenter for an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, my grandma would have loved to meet you because she was a great uh, Grant admirer, as am I. Of course, Lincoln is my number one, but uh, Grant was right up there. Uh, and I agree with you that his legacy, Lincoln's legacy was uh, carried on by Grant. So there is a consistency there. But actually Grant signed, or one of his secretaries actually signed, but it was Grant's signature on my grandmother's homestead patent uh, in 1868. So uh, she was, or her family was a beneficiary of the Homestead Act, which of course was also part of Lincoln's legacy. So I commend you for what you're doing to uh, rehabilitate Grant, so to speak. Um, not that he should need it, but apparently he does. As far as the high school uh, curriculum, it's largely still this regurgitation of the Dunning School. Uh, that's what I see now that I actually have a name to call it. Um, I mean, when I was in high school back in the 80s, such as yourself, uh, I, I could uh, relate to that as well. Um, you know, we didn't, we didn't know what it was that was being taught. That's just what the history textbook said. And that's what we believed because that's what we were told. But um, now that I have a name for it, um, I would say that that's still being uh, largely, largely taught um, at the high school level. And I regard that as, or I see it as intellectual laziness it's because it's been repeated over and over again. Uh, people tend to, instead of digging deeper, and that's why I commend you, you've, you've dug in deep and you've, you've uh, analyzed this and you found evidence that refutes the Dunning School. But nonetheless, most, or many, I shouldn't say most, but many um, who are otherwise bright, intelligent people don't bother to do that. They just simply repeat what they've, what they've heard. And unfortunately, um, the history textbooks, in a lot of cases, you know, it's, it's, that's pretty much what you see. So that's a, that's a real short answer to uh, Kurt's excellent question. Thanks for sharing that. And I'm sorry to hear that there has been so little progress in the high school textbooks since we were studying in the 80s. Wow. Well, and it's, un it's unfortunate that history in general is a not an appreciated subject uh, as it should be. Um, and what I mean by that is, and, and I don't mean to knock people that, uh, that coach, that, that's fine, that's great. But these people... I mean, administrations, and I know this for a fact, administrations hire people to teach based on what they can coach first, especially in social studies. Social studies or history is notorious for that. Mm -hmm. And history deserves as much respect as mathematics or English or you know, any of the other main subjects. You know, it is a core subject and we give it lip service but we don't do the walk as well as we do the talk. We, we claim that it's an important subject or it's a core subject in the curriculum, but that's not how it's treated. And you have people that, you know, are reading their golf magazines and they're supposed to be teaching history or, you know, something else. Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably being a little sarcastic there, but, but, I, but I've seen it firsthand. And that's why you're not getting an accurate assessment, not only of Grant, but of many other historical figures is because they're not, they're not digging deep enough. And so then they, you know, that's how the Dunning School fits into this. 
They just repeat what they've heard over and over. Well, then that leads to the $64 question, which is, uh, Frank, uh, what do you see as a way to start the process to get students and kids or maybe even college students um, to start thinking about analyzing the, the uh, historical writings that they are provided a little bit more critically? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And of course, the first step is for, for teachers to do, and those who develop curricula to do uh, more of their homework. Um, fact of the matter is we are in a largely, and I think Bryce is basically making this point, um, we're in a society that is in many ways historically illiterate. You have all of these statistics about people who don't know the most basic facts of American history, you know, placing the Civil War in the right century and so forth. And with that state of affairs, the sad reality, and the thing about these uh, presidential greatness polls, I think it actually, you know, the joke is in the end, at the end of the day, the joke is on the historians themselves, because this tells us more about historians than about their subjects. It's not the case that, you know, some of these presidents were once, uh, you know, Woodrow Wilson was once up here and now he's, you know, down here or Andrew Jackson, you know, similarly. Um, but it shouldn't be surprising uh, given the broader state of uh, historical knowledge that the average history professor uh, it does not have an encyclopedic message, uh, uh, encyclopedic knowledge, excuse me, of all the presidencies. They all tend to have their own focus, which is natural because there's only so much research you can do. Um, there's, we've also suffered from the development in higher education of abandoning traditional quote unquote great man history that focuses more on what governments are doing, what armies are doing and so forth. Uh, and you know, uh, ignoring a, a lot of those traditional topics in favor of what's known as history from below. Now, I, I don't say that to discourage those explorations. There should be more, you know, it's good that social and economic history have developed, but it's unfortunate that the more traditional historical subjects have suffered. And of course, all of these historical subjects are kind of crowded into a smaller and smaller uh, silo of uh, uh, or funnel of, of information at a time when educational priorities focus more on the STEM subjects and people don't realize, this is a, a broader observation, if you want students' mathematical and verbal skills to improve, you need to give children a broad-based education. Uh, and that, will, of course, we're all talking about history, but I think it you extend it to, to music, you extend it to every field of knowledge you can get, the different fields of knowledge will will feed into each other. Uh, and history is just a remarkable thing because it teaches us so much about life. I mean, it is a story. People respond to stories. And I think the you know, traditional uh, notion of, oh, we don't want too many dates to be thrown into our historical narratives. Well, I don't see how you avoid uh, the dates, but there are so many interesting ways that the story can be uh, integrated into any curriculum at any age. And if you're close to any sort of historic site, visit it, have field trips, have students come out. You know, we try to, uh, for, for the annual Grant birthday ceremony at Grant's tomb, we try to get as many school children as we can, make it a field trip, give them a, some exposure to this. Okay, here's a a great man who happens to be buried close to where your school is. What was he about? Uh, or your, your portal to that knowledge might be another chapter of history. But if you're interested in, for instance, the original founders, that generation, it's got to get you curious about, well, what happened next? What about the second founding? If you're interested in the civil rights movement, you may be, well, how did we get here? Uh, we should think more about. Uh, the uh, one of uh, our questioners called the, I think the cumulative effect of, of history that uh, one set of accomplishments happens on the shoulders of another set uh, of accomplishments. 
uh, how, look at the development of these notions of freedom and equality. We're sort of taught as Americans how to think that we elevate freedom and equality as like the preeminent American values. Well, where do those values come from? How are they manifested over the course of our history? And uh, how do we understand uh, the often difficult process of dealing with those uh, concepts, whether we're dealing with domestic issues like the ones that we tend to focus on when we talk about Grant or what Franklin Roosevelt uh, encountered during World War II with the challenge of fascism abroad and then a whole new international paradigm. Um, there's a whole world of stories out there and I think we need, I think teachers just need to present the material in a way that uh, can convey to students stories that hook them in, that get them interested, that get them asking questions. And, be, and I think they should also be unabashed about doing this with a view toward making students good, productive citizens. Doesn't mean indoctrinate people in one political ideology or another, but definitely teach them about what America means at its most fund in its most fundamental con uh, constructs. Teach about the foundational documents and events and uh, people, uh, you just can't do it without teaching uh, students about human beings for all of their imperfections. Because at the end of the day, a lot of these students who will go on to not only teach history, but be history makers themselves. Well, you're not going, if you wanna know what it means to advance liberty, you can't do it just looking at an abstract Neo, you know, uh, neoclassical figure of Lady Liberty holding the shield with the robes, there are living, breathing people who were charged with these various challenges. And all of them were imperfect. A few of them, uh, a lot of them did, did uh, some really good things. A, a select few did some really great things. And there should be uh, more of that, more of these foundations that are uh, conveyed to, to students so that they can help form, you know, the next uh, generation of, uh, of historians. Well, and that's Thank where you history and costume historical interpretation come in because it is a means of getting students interested in history, whether, you know, some of us, we, we like reading about it, but all too often students are turned off by that. But if you can, if you can hook them, if you can get them interested by, telling the story as if the person was actually speaking to them. I've done this for 30 years. It, it works. Uh, that, is a, that is a means of, of reaching them. Uh, and I also agree with field trips. The problem is school districts tend to cut uh, field trip budgets because they need it for you know, athletics and other things, uh, which I disagree with that. Uh, so I think we, I think we need to reprioritize some of our priorities. As far as Grant's tomb, I wanted to uh, tell you that I was there in 1987, um, and it was in pretty rough shape uh, even then. Uh, I had to actually tell my taxi driver, I remember I'm from Minnesota, so I'd never been to New York City in my life, but I had to tell my taxi driver how to get there. Um, I was glad I went. I was, it was well worth the, with the trip up there, uh, the ta taxi fare and whatever. But the point is, the taxi driver who's from that, you know, makes a living driving people around New York City. They didn't even know Grant was buried in New York City. Um, but it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm really happy to see that it's been restored uh, back to its, its original grandeur. So thank you for, uh, for your work on that. Right, um, and we may have uh, time for uh, one more question, but I wanted to, to follow up on one of Frank's comments about studying some of the, the bad parts of, of uh, history too, uh, to show some of the problems in order to make sure we, we don't repeat them. I, I just, uh, for the first time, heard about the uh, St. Patricio Battalion during the Mexican War and uh, the Irish uh, Battalion. I was uh, shocked to hear about the, uh, uh, the hangings and the, the uh, um, the uh, tor not the torture, but the hangings that occurred. But that's a part of uh, American history that is not really taught. And that's not a very good story to tell. And then of course we have um, the Indian Wars with some of the battles against the tribal nations. 
that are uh, not a, a big part of our our history, um, or it's kind of whitewashed. And I'm sure there are a lot of uh, stories about the African Americans that we we hear all the time, and uh, those are things that we that also have to be part of uh, the study of history. Bryce, you talked about the uh, tomb, and we did have some questions from folks about uh, how was it decided to be put in New York City. Grant lived the last four years of his life in New York City. You know, the, that 1881 to 85, that was his home. Uh, it was there that he invested all of his money, as did his immediate family members, uh, into uh, this investment firm, Grant and Ward, uh, the Grant and that name being Ulysses Jr. Well, that firm went belly up. Uh, Grant family found themselves several thousands of dollars in debt. And as, this is a story I know so many of you are familiar with. Grant spends the last year of his life uh, racing against death uh, to write his memoirs because he finds soon into beginning these memoirs that he's going to write to dig his family out of this hole, he learns that he's stricken with throat cancer. So during that period, Grant has this long, languishing, awful uh, months and months of uh, ordeal as he's writing his memoirs. His son, Fred, asks him where he would like to be buried. And there's evidence actually from a letter that Grant wrote, uh, it's pretty explicit evidence that if he had everything his way, he would have preferred West Point, but for a rule that women could not be buried there. And he was probably too modest to consider that West Point probably would have made an exception, even their own bureaucracy uh, for, for his wife, Julia, but that's why West Point was off the table. So he mentioned to Fred three locations, uh, not necessarily in this order, uh, but Galena or somewhere in Illinois, that was his home during his public career, St. Louis, where he lived for several years before the war, or New York City because of the kindness of New Yorkers to him in his time of need, in time of his financial destitution, where he had people reaching out for, uh, to, to offer him financial and emotional uh, support. So the moment William Grace, the mayor of New York, was on top of this. Uh, the moment Grant died, you know, he, he moved quickly to uh, see if he could offer uh, an enticing location in New York City for Grant's remains. Central Park almost became the site, but there was a cancer hospital being built right across from the proposed site. And Fred thought this will be demoralizing for cancer patients to look out at the tomb of someone who's suffering from cancer. So let's look at this new, really undeveloped park called Riverside Park, uh, which extends along the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Uh, found, started in 1875, most of it was dirt and trees, uh, but it occupied one of, not the highest, but one of the higher points of elevation overlooking the Hudson River. It was a spot of wonderful physical prominence and Julia Grant's widow and, and the family really liked that idea. They also loved New York City. Now, Grant died in a cottage up in the Adirondacks where he was taken six weeks before his death, but uh, they did have this brownstone home in New York City that was really his final uh, residence, even if he didn't literally die in, in New York City. Uh, but that was the reason uh, he was buried in New York. Well, thank you very much, Frank. I think uh, we've we've taken a lot of your time. I hope you get some sleep tonight to get back to the Supreme Court hearings, but uh, what a wonderful, wonderful presentation, uh, mind-blowing, and um, thank you very much for spending the time with us, and um, we'll be, a lot of us will be getting your book when it comes out. Maybe we can pre-order it on amazon.com. I'm not sure. I'll send you, uh, I'll send you a link, actually, to reserve through the publisher's site. Oh, but perfect. Thank you so That'll much. For having this is such a pleasure. And thank you all for, for being here and for your patience. Also with a long presentation, I really enjoyed it. Thank mm -hmm. you.